Good morning, I'm Mike Neundorfer with Advanced RV here in our pre-cab area of our manufacturing. And this is the area where we insulate the vans, we take the, all the trim out, uh, we do sound insulation. This is a butyl product that sticks onto areas and adds to the factory sound deadening. We put this totally over the wheel well and then put strips along inside the panels. That's sound insulation, now we talk about thermal insulation. We're gonna make the assumption that you're interested in van insulation with windows. We also assume that everybody watching this wants a quiet, comfortable van as much as possible. And comfort means uh, cool in the summer and warm in the winter. We also assume you want the least costly approach. There are materials that are less costly than uh, Thinsulate and less costly than wool but the installation costs and times can be pretty significant. And we're gonna talk about properties of moisture absorption and stuff later on. The other thing we're gonna assume is that when you have an insulated van, you wanna maximize the internal space. These are the, the objectives, these are our assumptions. And what we're gonna discuss in this video are the different types of heat transfer that affect how heat travels across the surfaces of an insulated and uninsulated van. We're going to talk about moisture and how it travels and what the sources are. Uh, we're going to talk about condensation from that moisture. We're going to talk about the fact that there is not a good empirical information about what's better. Um, some people think of uh, insulation that absorbs water is better and uh, they don't want a vapor barrier. Other people want a vapor barrier and non-absorbing insulation. So I hope you enjoy it. If you want to avoid the nerd talk, uh, stop listening right now. I'm here with Fred Algren, Dr. Fred Algren. Yeah. And uh, Fred teaches me every day about technical stuff. He's a PhD mechanical engineer. So I thought we'd talk about the fundamentals of, of uh, how heat stays in the van or stays out of it, be it winter or summer. And uh, Fred, I remember one thing about thermodynamics that there are three ways that heat transfers uh, from hot to cold. Heat transfers by radiation, by convection, which is the movement of warm air, and by conduction. Can right. you talk a little bit, Fred, about how that applies to a van? Well, a high percentage of the surface area of the van is windows. And all these heat transfer mechanisms are area dependent. So as long as there's this much window area, the windows tend to dominate, particularly in the summer, because in the summer you get radiation heat from the sun. That heat comes into the van, it gets in through the windows, it's absorbed in the van, and it cooks the van. You can have all kinds of insulation on the sidewalls, and as long as the van is 25-30% windows, that heat's gonna come in through the van. These standard windows are single pane glass and they have a very low R value. So we try to compensate for that with curtains with insulation, removable insulation and other things. Now, there's also conduction and convection through the structure of the van. All of this structure is attached, it's either glued, which gives us a little bit of thermal insulation. It interrupts the uh, thermal conductive transfer, but it's only a very small amount. But a lot of these are in contact, the structure with the skin. This is the roof skin. This is the structure. This is the wall skin. This is the structure. So there's contact there. Uh, and that creates uh, conductive heat transfer. Since a class B is pretty small, the walls are always put right up against this surface. I mean, the inner walls, we push them out as far as we can. So they're up against this surface, they're up against this surface. Now, we can put all different kinds of insulation in there, but you can also see there's cavities like this. Well, you'll hear people talking about the need to shove insulation into that cavity. And it's not a bad thing to do, but it, there's really not a heck of a lot of importance because this member is bonded to the outside wall. So you got steel conduction going from this surface to that surface. So even if you insulate in there, that insulation gets basically shorted out by this piece of steel. Advanced RV 
has investigated and installed a bunch of different insulation processes. We started out in a, in a very high number of vans. We put a recycled denim uh, insulation in, which had an R value from six to seven or eight. And with that, we did both insulation with and without vapor barrier installation. So from there, there was a lot of conversation internally and externally about absorption of moisture in the insulation and the, the denim would absorb moisture. So we went from there to a thinsulate material because it's hydrophobic, it doesn't absorb moisture. And it still provides from about three and a half to seven and a half R uh, insulating value. So very close to the R value of the uh, denim. This van, Adios, is getting wool. Uh, the client wanted it, we're good with it. This is wool insulation. The, the um, packaging has been cut so that the insulation is relaxing now. Uh, it's really the air captured in this insulation that gives it the insulating properties. So this will be cut and installed. I believe it's wool from uh, New Zealand. When it gets wet, it smells like a wet sweater, but uh, it's good insulation. It's supposed to be a, around R7 or R7.5. We're going to try to pull as we do with the hydrophobic uh, insulation. We'll try to pull insulation into as many of these cavities as we can. But even if you insulate in this cavity, if you've got thermal conductivity from this structure to the, to the roof, it's going to at least offset the insulation that you have in here. Can't have too much insulation. It's a matter of return on the investment of time and labor. I don't think we're putting a vapor barrier in. That brings up the next subject. We're told that they don't want to put a, a vapor barrier on the inside of the wool. Well, the outside of the van is a vapor barrier. When you get right down to it, there's only two materials, two kinds of materials that are true vapor barriers. They're metal and glass. There are no plastics that are true barriers. They are restrictors, they slow it down. One of the reasons they have a vapor barrier is people expel a lot of moisture. A lot of that water that you expel in the fall and spring and winter, you'll find condensed on the walls. And you can see the water, it's condensing on the outer surface. Well, if you didn't have a vapor barrier of some kind, or I'll call it a retarder, if water can diffuse through that insulation, it can still condense on the sidewall. And when it condenses on the sidewall, now you can have droplet water on the inside wall, which as long as it's a hot day, the skin can heat up, it'll dry the water back out again. If it stays cold, you actually could end up with an ice layer on the inside of the wall, inside the insulation. It'll sit there as ice because you're not gonna get enough heat to come through to melt it. The insulation will either absorb the condensation or it will not absorb it. The thinsulate type of insulation does not absorb water. Recycled denim absorbs water, wool absorbs water. If you put a, a vapor barrier on the inside and it's warm on the inside, and you have insulation that keeps the skin cold on the outside, then the moisture isn't gonna be as likely to travel through, soak the insulation, or create a condensate on the inside. What's the answer to all this? I don't know. It's a complicated uh, calculation. It's a complicated modeling that you have to do to figure out what's better. So we've done them all. We have kind of decided our standard uh, for clients that say, use your judgment, is for a hydrophobic, non-absorbing insulation and a vapor barrier. So that's kind of our go-to. This is a, a kit. Uh, that we're gonna start, actually, we're gonna start offering on our Upfitters resource website, full disclosure, uh, because we've found it works so well. We have done a, uh, a 3D model of the inside of the van and we have identified every piece of insulation that goes in every panel. Uh, this is hydrophobic, seven and a half R value, about the same as the wool, according to the wool's manufacturer. Um, and every piece is labeled and numbered and there's a kit of instructions. So this is a, a kit for a sprinter. We have them for 144, 170, and 170 extended. Hi, Catherine. Hi. One of the things we want to do is give people an idea how long it takes to install different types of uh, insulation. 
-hmm. Catherine's uh, an accountant, so she's very precise. Uh, just finishing her bachelor's in accounting and uh, on to her master's next year. So we, mm -hmm. we only have Catherine this summer. Yeah. Uh, but you did one of the kits. And let me give just a little background. I don't know if you were here, uh, but typically we take from this roll of uh, thinsulite type material, uh, hydrophobic material, and we have a whole bunch of uh, patterns here and we line these up and uh, we cut out for every panel in the van. So we can go in there, stick them on and we've insulated every panel. But uh, you recently used our new kit where we CNC cut all these, uh, computer uh, aided cutting machine that cuts these, puts them in kits. How long did it take you to install the whole kit, to do the whole van? It took me probably between three and four hours, but that was also my first time like touching the kit at all. And how were the instructions? What are the instructions like for the kit? There was like a map of the entire van and there was numbered panels and so you just had to match the numbers to the panels and that showed you exactly where to put everything. And what kind of degree do you need to, to do that? <laughs> it, was, it was pretty easy to install. <laughs> right. You weren't here, but Johanna and Patrick installed the wool. How long did that take? Did you hear? I think it took the two of them the whole day, so 16 hours approximately. Okay. There's a, a, a phrase in accounting called materiality. If you're trying to balance the books at the end of the month and you're four cents off, it's, it's considered not material. But if you're uh, 40,000 off, that's material. And so what we're trying to always figure out when we're looking at insulation is materiality. We don't know what the right answer is. We think that this approach uh, from a labor standpoint and effectiveness standpoint, the fact that it doesn't absorb water we think this combined with a, another layer of soundproofing and a vapor retarder is a very solid system. When we have taken vans apart for service uh, with all the different insulations that we used in the past, at, uh, to my knowledge, we've never found any issue with uh, sitting water or uh, a, a rust due to uh, condensation on the metal surfaces. I don't that, think we've seen corrosion on the inside no, surface of the van. We haven't seen corrosion. So to my you know, meager technical knowledge, I think we're doing a, a good job, but I don't see any huge problem with putting uh, wool in. I don't see a huge problem with putting treated denim in. I don't see a problem with fiberglass, except it's itchy. Uh, so Fred, do you, what, what can you add to all that? Nothing. I mean we're a custom van builder. If somebody comes in and they believe that wool is the way to go, they can have it their way. Sure. If they come in and say, what would we typically do? We would put in a hydrophobic bat insulation because that's what we have gravitated to after going through fiberglass, denim, thinsulite, and then this is a replacement for 3M thinsulate. We hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if you're looking for uh, solid dogmatic answers, sometimes the more you know, like Fred, uh, uh, it, it's harder to be dogmatic, and I appreciate that about him. So we're, we're social distance, so I have my mask off. Fred's keeping his yeah, That's right. We're social distance, and I'm upwind. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the, the uh, video.